when you have that mentality of I can escape from any position, you feel almost untouchable. It's a psychological thing. Like if you know you can escape from any position and then get back to the offense, you also reduce the cognitive load in competition. But you don't have to worry, oh my God, this guy might pass me and I also have to worry about attacking. You, I, I believe that we have to reduce our cognitive load so we only focus at one thing at a time. That like I can really engage fully on just trying to attack my partner or trying to funnel it back into my best guard position rather than thinking, oh, I have to funnel back into my guard position and now I got to worry that, oh, maybe they'll pass me in the process of doing that. You can't have that sort of worry. So Margot, one of the questions that you must get a ton, because I know I'm super interested in it, is how have you managed to be a multiple time world champion while doing as much traveling and living nomadically as you do? I mean, most world champions seem to have a home gym and a home stable of people they train with. And you're kind of the opposite of that. So how on earth do you manage this, uh, this nomadic lifestyle while continuing to train at a high level? I think early on in my jiu-jitsu journey, I had the privilege of traveling to a lot of different places. I already had originally, I trained in London in the United Kingdom. So I had my, basic understanding of, okay, these are my training partners within the United Kingdom. I then shortly uh, after like my first three months of training jiu-jitsu, I traveled to Asia where I started to really uh, network with the Hong Kong jiu-jitsu scene, the scene in Japan. And again, it's how, how I see being able to train nomadically is mainly based on trying to understand who are your best training partners that can help you improve as fast as possible. So especially because I I pretty much was already full-time from, I want to say, after eight months of training, I already knew that I wanted to be full-time in jiu-jitsu. It was just a decision that I made. I kind of knew. And I really wanted to be able to keep the two passions that I had in my life some some somehow intertwined together. And those two passions are mainly jiu-jitsu and traveling. I think like traveling is also one of the best ways to learn. You encounter many different sorts of problems. And I think you learn a lot about different people, cultural immersion, and the same way with jiu-jitsu. You have so many fresh problems that you are able to problem solve and more importantly, really refine your ability to improvise. I think jiu-jitsu is largely about understanding how to improvise at the highest level. It's not a regurgitated choreography. Therefore, actually, in in my eyes and the way that I think, I believe actually traveling to a lot of different places exposes you to many different problems. Often when you're only exposed to the problems at your home gym, when you go to a competition or you go to a different gym, you often encounter like this kind of weird feeling where you roll with someone new and you're like, ah, I'm not used to their reactions with like how I play Delhi, but my training partners usually react this way. So instead of kind of worrying about that, I kind of build a really strong mindset in that number one, if I don't have the training partners that I need at the level that I need, I need to think about what are my strengths or weaknesses. When I'm able to think about that very specifically it's a matter of like you must have heard lots of people talk about this it's about specific training even a white and blue belt can be very competent training partners in specific skill areas it's also kind of my job as a higher belt to try and invest time and energy into making my training partners better and i just pretty much maintain this mindset wherever i went and of course over the years i've been training jiu-jitsu it will be 10 years this july I tried to really accelerate um, having these training partners at like at least every continent. So anytime that I'd go to a competition, I reliably always know, okay, in Europe, these are the places I can train at. These people train here. Therefore, I can always have some sort of reliable training environment that I don't have several unknowns, for example. I think going to an unknown place, if you have to travel consistently, that is what will take away from your training. And of course, like in order to actually get better, it, it's all about consistency and trying to really allow the efforts to compound upon each other. If you don't have some method of creating consistency, it's going to be really hard to become world-class because there's a lot of people who do globetrot um, and they go to a lot of different gyms, but it's really hard to find ways to stay accountable for yourself. And that that's another area of discussion, I believe. Like if 
you normally in a world-class facility or any sort of facility, you have a coach that you're accountable to. And as much as like my coach currently is Marilo Santana, I have to be accountable for my own actions and my own progression, my own learning. I've been my own coach for the most part of my career. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think all of us should be thinking about evaluating our own strengths and weaknesses, what can make us more complete, how we can become better. And actively, it's, I think it's these mental models that I set up for myself in terms of like, number one, how do I learn better? How do I progress no matter where I am at? Because I haven't always had access to world-class facilities. Like I grew up in the United Kingdom in an era where there were barely any women also training. So most of my training partners for a little while were larger guys who were also mainly um, interested in MMA. So it's not, not so relevant, my, my sort of game that's very orientated around um, the open guards, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So there's so many questions I have. I guess the first one is, uh, when you say consistency, what do you mean? Do you just mean frequency of training, training once or twice a day, day after day? Or do you mean consistency training with the same people? Because that seems to be the opposite of what you're doing by traveling so much. Right. So I think consistency uh, consistency here does apply to several different things. Like, as I said, because I, I've, I traveled really early on in my career, I already kind of set up hubs in every continent that I understand, okay, these are people that I can trust that number one won't hurt me so I can continue to maintain some sort of longevity, uh, refrain from getting injured, but also that I can reliably train with them in that location. Like that, that's a way that I kind of see consistency. Like I don't need to, I don't need to be in the same home facility every day, but it is really important to establish having training partners that I can rely on, that I can work with and problem solve against those people. Uh, consistency in training is of course very important that, um, you obviously, if you're, aspiring to be a high level competitor it's that's kind of a standard that we have to train like at least five days a week in my opinion there's no doubt in saying that but what i mean in consistency is consistent to your accountability to evaluate and be really honest with yourself about what you need to work on and i think a lot of it's really easy for a lot of high level competitors to kind of forget about that because when you're stuck in the hard work it's easy to turn off your mind and it's hard to think about the hard shit that you really need to work on. And I think a lot of people don't like to admit this because, you know, it, it just seems like pretty common sense that if you're a high level competitor and you're trying to compete at the highest level, surely you should give it some thought. But when you're actually engaged in the process, because this is me being totally honest with you, there have been many times where I'm so tired that I don't have energy to watch instructional some days. I don't have energy to try and think about my mistakes or like try and review the tape from class and stuff. Cause I'm a really big advocate of filming my roles. Sometimes I just don't have any energy, especially if I have to take in consideration the other things that I have to do in my life outside of jujitsu. I think the consistency is the promise to yourself that you will actually do those things. Not necessarily, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be a daily practice, but at least a few times a week that you will tick off all of those boxes having so when it comes to when it comes to training for competition margot what do you see those boxes as what's on margot's box list so for competition it definitely comes down to like we want to do our best to refine our a game but nonetheless throughout the year we should always be aiming to try and make our game as well-rounded as possible and trying to find a way to get deeper understanding of jujitsu outside of just the techniques, like thinking about like uh, the underlying principles such as space management, distance management, thinking about it in regards to timing. These things all have to be refined, especially when you are a high-level competitor. The, the number one thing is not the knowledge. Everyone at a certain level, I believe, will start to, it, it will start to kind of like, level level off like the knowledge we have is just going to be like here everything that matters is going to be how it's applied all in terms of timing and that that's what you're going to find like in like the really great jiu-jitsu matches even like some of the recent matches from the adcc brazilian trials um 
you'll see like some people, some of the athletes have fantastic timing and to train that, like that is the hardest skill because I, I think drilling technique is not difficult. Refining your timing against the best is the hardest skill. I think most of my work around competition is mainly contemplating about tempo, tempo changes and figuring out timings in regards to technique application. That's a lot of work that I do. And this is largely a thinking exercise around the competition rounds. Because generally, at least at Unity, because I do try and center myself at Unity around the major competitions like Pan Am's, Worlds and stuff. And that's pretty much what I will be doing. Basically, after this stint in Barcelona, I head back to the States tomorrow. Um, until June, I'll pretty much be stationed mainly in New York. Um, and... Mainly, so how our pro training works, it's Monday to Thursday we have pro training. Generally starts at 11 o'clock and will be somewhere between two to two and a half hours long. And generally there's always the same structure of warm up. You have some timing drills or like some sort of speed drills. You have some specific training and then you have the sparring section. And for me, I always think about sparring as data collection, but I have to set intentions before those competition rounds. That whether it's so, like something that I just mentioned about timings or in a specific position, working specific timings, et cetera, et cetera, those become very, very important around competition season. Um, I think where it differs outside of competition season is I don't feel it is as important to set an intention. I, I think a lot of things will come very organically because as Many of us say like jujitsu is very intuitive, but being able to articulate about things that are intuitive is like a very difficult task at times. Can can you give a concrete example of the last timing thing that you are working on? It could be as granular or as uh, micro as as you like. I, adjusting okay. a grip, it doesn't matter. What was it? So. At current, currently, my main competition game is very largely centered around De La Hiva and Lapel Guard. I know that to be my A game, but it's not a surprise to anybody who knows about me. So it's not like I'm sharing any secret information. Um, so I know in specific lapel entanglements or De La Hiva entanglements that I, I basically anticipate my partner's movements, but they, I kind of predict ahead of time where they're going to be in space in relation to um, what I'm doing, right? Because if I arrange my body positioning in a certain way, a, a term that I like to use is um, moving architecture, or you can kind of like freeze it and say it's resting architecture. So think of the bodies as buildings. And I kind of coined this phrase from a friend of mine who's a professional dancer. He likes to use this term resting architecture. If you have a static body in front of you in a fixed position, so if I just kind of took like a snapshot of it in time, I understand that the body is here in front of me at this specific time. Because I can understand where my partner's body is in time, I can kind of relate back to it with a specific timing. Understanding if my partner advances in a particular point in space, my timing to get into the new space that I want to, that will funnel me closer to my end game, that is what needs to be trained. So specifically, an exchange that I often think about is like the reverse Della Worm entanglement, because there is a specific window of time that I understand I have to be above my partner's knee line. If I fail to do this, my chances of finishing um, the move to funnel into a back take or into some type of sweep becomes infinitely more difficult. So I understand there's a specific timing. If I identify the moment of time where I can go above my partner's knee line. That is the point of time where I have to practice acceleration and tempo changes. Um, because I, I think a lot of people also know me for like this idea of like, oh, Margot really likes to flow. She's like pretty chill. She's not really a Pahada type of athlete. And I definitely relate to that. And I largely advocate for it. But there are particular times I do believe that everybody needs to be able to accelerate and be able to understand, okay, this is the point of time that like, my previous velocity is no longer serving me. If I continue to operate at this uh, speed, I know that I'm not going to get to the particular part of space that I need to be in relation to my partner. And that's generally how I think about timings. I kind of visualize the space first. Where do I want to be in the space in relation to my partner? Then I can figure out the relationship between the space and what timing I need to execute in order to get there. So then how do you drill that? Is it, do you drill that through sparring or do you drill that through very situational 
sparring where you put your opponent or your training partner in reverse de la worm guard and say, at some point you have to step, I don't know, step forward, but I don't know what timing that is. Like how, how do you train for that? Obviously there's a visualization and uh, mental breakdown component, but then at some point you have to translate that into your body doing things to another body on the mat. I think where specific, this is more more so pretty exclusive to the lapel guard, I want to say, but because how I see lapel guard is it's a very effective form of movement restriction that makes it even easier to anticipate my partner's uh, body movements. I understand even when I transition through several different types of lapel guards, generally I understand how I'm going to be connected to my partner's body and it which point I can uh, advance above their knee line. I think specific training can be a really useful form of training this. But if I have to uh, explain why I do for myself, generally all of this takes place in free sparring. Generally because like the where this timing specifically gets trained, so at least in this specific example, is very close to the initiation stage of getting into a guard. It, it isn't like in the middle of a sequence or towards the end of the sequence. I acknowledge if I can get above the knee line that I'm very, very eight out of ten times I'm going to get this bullshit statistic. By the way, so just just when saying, you say eight out <laughs> when you say getting above the knee line, what do you mean? I, I, it's going to be tough to explain verbally. Yeah. <laughs> without no, no, yeah. I'll do my best here. Um, so when I'm engaged in a specific type of lapel entanglement, so if we imagine the body positioning to be similar to that of a reverse stellar hero or kiss of the dragon type movement, understand that my head will be pointing towards my partner's center line, so more towards this direction. When I have a lapel, so the far side lapel, and it's entangled towards my partner's near side leg, so we have a diagonal sort of control that restricts posture here, my aim is to understand that my, my leg that is in the reverse de la esque sort of position is going to find its way to get above my partner's knee line. Because how I look at the human body is generally, it's kind of like a ladder. We start at the toe line, we advance towards the knee line, and we get to the hip line. So if we can get to the hip line, we have access to the upper body, the torso, and then we can figure out whether we're going to obtain a mount position or back take sort of position. So that's kind of why I mean when I refer to things like the end game. The end game for me is understanding what is the final position I want to be in, in terms of my movement objectives. I always assign two sets of objectives. Um, we have our movement objectives, which should always be our first priority, and then looking to our finishing objectives, because generally the movement objective will be our means of finding ways to control our partner so that we can slowly advance up our partner's body. Once I'm able to get above that knee line, my partner, especially in a lapel entanglement, has minimal mobility. They're, they're very stuck because I, I haven't let go of the lapel yet at this stage. And I'm really able to actually almost have this sense of expanding time. Because I am able to expand time, I can actually have a little bit longer to make better decisions as to where I should advance in the space. That, that for me is the beauty of the lapel guard. Because otherwise, in more dynamic positions, even to mention like the De La Hiva guard, where there is no sort of fabric manipulation, decision making is pretty much on the fly. Like it's very dynamic. I think it's much harder to master the De La Hiva guard than the lapel guard, for example. But if you can kind of extrapolate the ideas that I kind of talk about from the lapel guard into these other various open guard positions, I think it's a lot easier to understand like how you can train timing. I think how I would explain lapel guards is that if you think about learning how to ride a bicycle as a child, you initially have to stabilize the wheels. The lapel guard almost gives you this sense of like being able to digest these concepts and these principles that you can slowly later on translate into all the other open guards. That at least has been my experience and like how I've managed to get deeper understanding on how to train timing. Because it, it's very difficult, honestly. It's very difficult to think, well, how do I train a timing? Because like you you simply force to spar a lot and be very aware of the role without distorting the role, which 
also is a really difficult skill to develop. So I think a lot of people are like very dishonest about how <laughs> their roles. And I'm like, yeah, I totally beat up that guy. And then like you look at the role, you look at the footage, and like that that wasn't really what happened. You barely got an advantage over that guy. You know, like the kind of storytelling that we deliver of our roles is often not accurate. And that's why I really strongly advocate for filming. So then how are you, I know you were going to go into a uh, Nogi training cycle and I can't really think of a worse, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of a worse base for Nogi than lapel guard. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of almost caricaturized by the, you know, the self-defense community. What are you going to, you know, take a guy's gi and wrap around the guy's <laughs> leg? Well, I mean, not you know, ignoring the fact that most of the time in most parts of the world, people are wearing clothing and you can do that to them. We'll, we'll ignore that. But uh, I imagine that's a tough transition or do you see it differently? I, I think like what a lot of people, um, like at least in relation to me, right? A lot of people think like there's a very, a very well-known understanding of that. Okay, like my game is centered around uh, a lot of the Pelga and De La Hiva. But I also spend a lot of time at, uh, especially at Purple Belt, really developing my knowledge of like transitioning through a lot of different guards, whether it's half guard, butterfly, uh, transitional knowledge between like all the open guards. And basically I, I have a lot of confidence in transitioning through guards that don't involve the lapel guard that go really well into Nogi. Like I have a very well established Nogi game that is actually very centered around, um, first of all, just understanding like, how is the person, how is my partner positioned in relation to the floor? Are they two knees down, combat base, standing? It's like my, my game obviously, and everyone's game is gonna vary depending on how a partner is uh, situated on the floor. So if my partner has two knees down, generally it's gonna be like a half guard butterfly sort of game. I actually modeled a lot of my Nogi game off of Craig, Craig Jones. Um, I spent a little time in Australia for like a year and a half. So I was cross training between the Gold Coast and Melbourne. And I, I thought like my body type was quite similar to Craig at the time. So I kind of used a lot of Z guard, half, butter, uh, half butterfly. If someone would go to standing, then I'm more of the De La Hiva, underhook De La Hiva, reverse De La Hiva sort of game, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't see, I don't anticipate too many problems. I, I think the main problem that if I can openly admit is more that I have a very strong bias and tendency to be very self-indulgent in flow mentality and um, transitional flow rather than trying to hold and be very tight with my position. So that's actually the what cut out for me this year for like the Nogi training camp and ADCC qualifiers is trying to find ways to Actually, it's more a it's a psyche thing, a psychological thing. It's like even with uh, gi for me, I would always rather go the path of least resistance. I'm not the type that wants to scramble, but I truly believe that this is it's simply a mental model, a mental construct that you kind of place into your head. And like, okay, like if you understand that's what you have to do different and execute it. It sounds sorry, quite. What What is the mental model that we're talking about here? It, Trans the transition based game or the, the holding based game so I, I feel like going back to the topic of self-indulgence and flow mentality right i think my weakness is not a knowledge thing because my knowledge is very deep however my um willingness to engage in different games is a very very different thing you know like it's like perpetuating, oh, I'm only going to play my A game in competition, but actually you have so much other knowledge to demonstrate. It's more, um, goes back to these topics of like kind of human fear, like, oh, if I'm in this position, I might not do as well. What I mean by kind of like playing with your psyche or like inserting a new mental model is more that if, if you understand the road to winning, which if you kind of dumb it down, and don't make it about a confidence thing. It, it's all understanding like how to match positions and timings. So in a way, it is kind of like chess, although I don't fully agree with the chess jujitsu analogy, just because like in chess, like the timing is completely different. Um, but I, I think for Nogi, that's that's my, where my work has to be cut out. 
because I don't obviously have the ability to rely on the lapel. It, for me, I think it's going to be a, a big psychological shift in the way that I think about jujitsu. So one thing I wanted to pick your brain about was this idea of three-step and five-step systems, which you teased on your Instagram. <laughs> uh, we had a short little exchange there. Yeah. But now I'm going to hold you to account. <laughs> what do you mean by a three-step system, a five-step system, and this idea of gameplay? So I, I think there are many different modes of gameplay, and I, I want to kind of introduce like a video game analogy, just so like people can get a, like a better visual and like visualize it here. But you can have, for example, like a a free play stage where you're basically just trying as many different combos possible. But you can have like a campaign stage, for example, which would be similar to going to competition where everything should be like as efficient as possible. We're not really trying to be creative in a sense of trying to experiment. It's not about experimentation. It's just about getting the job done. Now, in regards to the three part, five part system, that that's kind of like just generic numbers for me. Like what I mean in terms of like three part, five part system is understanding like at least the way that I think and how I break down uh, sequences. I break down sequences into three main parts. There's the initiation, the mid stage, and like the end stage. So that's number one, how I look at sequences. But to every sequence, you can have multiple parts that gets you to your end game. For example, I have a reverse de one move that only requires one move to funnel to the back tick, which is effectively my end game. So that in itself would just be a one part move. But a lot of different sequences require a, a little bit more setup and a little bit more moves until I can actually get into my end game. So for example, like there's a, let's say we start in the spider lasso position. If I start in spider lasso position, let's consider that to be our initiation stage. And there's no set amount of um, moves that you could put in any of the stages really. But for me and generally, I, try and model it on like what I believe. I think the initiation is generally going to be some type of guard ball or takedown. And the mid stage is kind of like the mid section of like, what are the moves that will funnel me towards the end game? Again, just as a reminder, the end game is generally when I get into my final control position that will lead me to my submission position. So generally I would say that the mid game or the mid stage uh, portion of the sequence is generally where the most moves happen. It's the initiation and the end. It's just kind of like, writing a book or writing an essay like you have the beginning part of the beginning paragraph and the end paragraph and then everything else is kind of like the meat of the material uh, when you can think about what moves have to occur in the mid stage i think it's like relatively easy to understand okay initiation moves super super simple to kind of look at similarly with end game very very simple to look at um so i keep using the word funnel and I think it's easiest for me to try and articulate this generally in regards to lapel guards. I think it's really easy to see, firstly, what does the pathway look like around the body? Now, generally, a lot of spins and a lot of inversions, te they, they tend to take a circular pathway, free space, like spiral-like pathway. So number one is first being able to visualize the pathway around your partner's body. So if I initiate, like, let's discuss initiation. If I start in a De La Hiva guard, like, how many parts of the move do I need to execute in order to firstly get my lapel entanglement? And then you can start to see like, oh, okay, like that is okay, effectively so just, what just, from, just from De La Hiva to your yeah. first work to your first entanglement. Yeah. Oh, uh, how many moves is that typically? I mean, it's against a white belt. You grab the lapel and you stick it around the guy's leg. Okay, done. Yeah. But if you're going against somebody who's your level or comparable, how many how many moves does that one grip change require? I generally want to say, and don't quote me on this fully, but generally it's like five or six moves. Just to change so, the grip or get that just, initial just grip. To, against someone like I want to say like the top ten black belts, like in my division. Um top top five. <laughs> like generally it's because like understand there's so much back and forth, right? They they also know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to mask my intention. I'm trying my best to like mask the clarity. So I also, am, I'm really fond of sharing this idea of um, fighting is about the art of deception. 
So the more clarity I display in my moves, the easier it is for you to anticipate what I'm going to do. Therefore, I have to lull you into a sense of safety. Here's where it sounds very sociopathic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm lulling you into a sense of safety that you know exactly what I'm going to do next. But in fact, I know that you're anticipating what I'm going to do next based on like what you think I'm going to do. However, because I already know that you're anticipating a certain move, I make kind of unorthodox grip switches that makes the person react in a different way, alters their body positioning that actually leaves them more um, vulnerable to what I originally wanted to do. That's why I can take a lot more moves and can be a lot more laborious. So although it does have a lot more moves than the one part technique that I could just do and hit a back tick, like that's kind of what, what happens with high level practitioners. It's not about like, oh, I do one move and then I, <laughs> I wish I wish it was that easy at one championship level. But um that's why like I can't really put a number of moves, but it's more understanding how the gameplay can work. If you think about the initiation, okay, that's like where we now start. I've decided that I'm going to start in the Delhi, but I've connected to my partner. Given that I have these frames connected to my partner, now like we can start to understand in a sort of video game sense, if I have my frames here, or like even thinking about the body as a maze, like you wouldn't walk into like the bush or like the kind of green part of the maze, right? You want to try and go into areas that are open. You want to try and occupy empty space that will eventually leave your partner in a disadvantageous position. And that, that's kind of what I'm trying to articulate by uh, discussing gameplay. But the post that I made about gameplay is actually to kind of encourage more um, abstract conversation, actually, because I, I spent a little bit of time cross-training in contemporary dance. And this is where a lot of um, terminology actually kind of crossed over for me. But I think because dance has been around a lot longer than jiu-jitsu, a lot of people have actually spent a lot of time thinking about how to teach dance and how to articulate certain movement pathways through space. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, because it's just the nature of being a younger sport, a younger arts, I think we often have a tendency to just teach as our predecessors did. And often that's not always the most optimal way to optimize the learning process. I think being able to really visualize space better, visualize time, understand the framework of gameplay that is where I think deeper understanding in jiu-jitsu can be obtained faster. Not that the goal is to learn fast. I don't believe that to be the goal because for yeah. me, I really enjoy the process of learning. Okay. It's nice. It's nice to accelerate the learning process. I think it's like a very Western concept. Like I have to get this like that, like instant gratification culture. But like, I think there's so much beauty in kind of like figuring it out for yourself. And almost like as much as I sell instructionals, I film instructionals <laughs> and I'm trying to help people learn faster than I once did. But that's less about wanting to help people learn fast actually and more that I would like to free up their time to actually investigate in different areas of jiu-jitsu that I didn't have time to actually learn about, for example. I think we can allow for a lot more innovation if we're teaching the old material, the former material, much faster. But again, this is me being self-indulgent. <laughs> I have definitely two opinions on this topic. <laughs> well, I also imagine that knowing that you have a competition coming up in six weeks, eight weeks, or even six months, does you know it, it's like the sense of knowing that you're to be shot in the morning focuses the mind wonderfully knowing that you have to put it on the line six weeks six months from now it, it doesn't it constrain like this it's not just all about learning at some point it is about using and having advanced more than your your rival competitor and being able to beat them is it not can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, do you mean in, well, in you, terms you talk of about like the love of game? learning and that the goal is not to learn faster? And I agree that that's a mindset that you can use. If your goal is, oh my god, I got to come out of this training session having learned ten new moves, that's probably not productive. On the other hand, given that you're going to have to compete against some of the people that you've competed with before, who have yeah. been improving. There is actually pressure on you to learn and learn relatively fast and improve. So how do you balance those two things of like loving learning and kind of wanting to be in a, uh, a not feeling under pressure to learn faster, but at the same time, they're very much being, you know, 
uh, career incentives and financial incentives to learn faster? So I think um, this is, again, in relation to my personal experience, I, I think I, I think in terms of like competition phases, like, of course, like we want to we do want to optimize our process, but I think this is actually, I want to challenge the conversation a little bit. And it's more about insecurities and psychology of the athlete, especially when you're trying to impose your A game, where that's usually our intention in the competition. You actually funnel the game into a very narrow um, game of jujitsu. So often my personal feeling and my data collection of recent competitions for me Generally, the game is so small that actually it's not necessarily like huge problems that I have to worry about. Like, oh, am I learning faster than my opponent? I don't feel under pressure to learn more. I actually, going back to the topic of insecurity, I don't have any insecurity on my knowledge. I, I dare say, it's a little bit controversial to say out loud on a podcast, I don't have to say it anyway. I, I think my knowledge is much higher than a lot of my competitors. But where I... Where I, one of my downfalls is more about the timing and the tempo changes. Uh, this is why I have such confidence in my jiu-jitsu is generally like that. It's in relation to that or that I get funneled out of my position into body position that does not serve me, that does not allow me to retain my structure. And because I have such almost delusional belief in the way that I think, like I don't necessarily worry too much about that because I understand that I, I have the ability to funnel jiu-jitsu into a much smaller game. It's not so infinite. If it was more infinite, I would definitely be thinking along the same lines as you. It's like, oh, yeah, like I need to make sure that I'm learning as fast as possible because like, I, I would feel more under pressure that my fellow athletes that I have to compete against would be um, – they might just know more than me. But I, I think it's more of like whether I'm able to successfully funnel someone into my game rather than being funneled into their game, because that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. Like, do I have enough knowledge to play their game or to successfully transition from their offensive cycle and put them into defensive cycle, stuff like that. But can, can we talk about that? And can you elaborate on this idea? Because competitors do have their A games. Yeah. And they kind of have got their their, their B games. And obviously, if, it, if you really, really want to win, yeah. you're trying to take it to your A game. Mm -hmm. but so is the other person. Yeah. So then how do you make sure that you end up there and that they don't? I mean, at, at a very simple level, it's with two guard players, a big determinant is who pulls guard first. Um, and that, that's a very simplistic thing. I'm sure it gets much, much more uh, complicated than that. So I, I think, again, it's like having the ability to visualize a pathway, no matter what sort of body positioning your partner is presenting to you. For example, if two players engage in a double guard pull scenario, there's still the same ladder still exists, like the toe line, the knee line, the hip line. So you have to be able to problem solve in an appropriate way that gets you to understand what are my options in order to reveal the end game? How do I create back exposure in these situations? Um, in terms of like when a, one athlete is obviously trying to impose the A game versus the other person, it, again, it, it all comes down to timing. Like it is a little bit about who does it first, but I'm also of the belief that the reason why I um, find it easy to come, like kind of counter my partner from funneling me into their A game. For example, if someone tries to knee cut past me and I'm not in my favorite guard, I've spent so much time at the lower belts training from late stage guard retention or like kind of late stage defense scenarios and how to transition out of them into a successful offensive cycle. So we, I think as of late, everyone is very familiar with this idea of like, we want to try and minimize the time that it takes to switch from a defensive cycle to offensive cycle. As John Dana has really popularized these um, terms in the Jiu Jitsu instructional scene. I've spent so much time trying to understand how to close that window, how to transition from a defensive cycle to offensive cycle, which always means that I can get back into the offense that I'm looking for, getting into my A game, especially with the nature of black belt matches being 10 minutes long. 
I, I am the type of player that likes to kind of go the length of the match. And this has been the case since I was a blue belt. It is something I'd like to change into the future and see like, if I can emulate a more Pohada style. But as of now, um, generally, I like to play the length of the match. And I understand I don't need to, I don't have stress to get from a defensive cycle to offensive cycle, even in the first two minutes. I'm kind of trying to read my partner, especially if I haven't fought them before. I spend the first two to three minutes just kind of understanding, okay, like they have the tendency to move like this. Their movement quality is like this. They like to pass in this particular sort of body positioning. It's more about kind of reading habits and where there can be potential openings. And I, I think when you start from almost a place that's a little bit submissive, you're giving the other person a little bit of confidence that like, oh, I'm going to be okay here. And that goes back to the kind of like sociopathic art of deception sort of thing. <laughs> that like I, I pose myself that like I, I'm not a threat. But like when I identify that there's an opening, and it goes back to this idea of training timing, training acceleration and tempo changes, this is why I try to capitalize. I don't I don't believe that you have to necessarily impose on someone until you fatigue them. That is one method of winning and very, very effective at that. Like if I could be that sort of person who enjoyed doing that, I would definitely do it. But I, I understand myself as a person and as a fighter. My personality is also very rep represented by my fighting style. I think those two two things are very connected with each other. I have no desire to do that. But yeah, that's a little bit <laughs> how I think if, in terms of the A games. Do you think that that starting slightly defensive, slightly passive and letting the other person reveal their their intentions comes from training in so many different places. Because if you went to a new club to train and you just went hard right off the bat, the other person would go hard right off the bat, and you'd but end you up also in a don't death. Learn. I don't believe you learn if you're always imposing because you're so used to not engaging with jujitsu. I think the real deep understanding and deep learning in jujitsu is when you get caught in problems. It's like, how do you do math if you don't actually get in? It's like you almost ignore it. I'm like, ah, I don't need to do it. Like, I, I just want to use a calculator. But you don't, didn't actually know how you solve the problem, you know? Because it, it's so much easier to win if you impose. That, that is my personal belief. If I just impose and I spam, I blitz pass as fast as possible, and I overwhelm my opponent into fatigue straight away, that is of course going to be the easiest way. So I didn't get into any jujitsu. But once you connect someone, like say, into their best position, and you try to really kind of strip the frames away, it, it's almost like you you really kind of kill the person's sense of confidence that it's like, wow, like I got into all of that jujitsu and they still beat me. And is for this me, a that's training strategy for. or a competition strategy, Margot? It's more of a training strategy. Yeah. So that, to give you're me not going to give your competitor at the black belt, at the, the finals match, their best position and go. For sure. For sure. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> maybe, want... when I, maybe when I'm better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not yet. I, I would hope that I'm so good in the future that I could do that. But right now, like I, I want to at least win a black belt world championship first before I can say that sort of shit. Um, I, I think, I think just, the, I, I still set boundaries. Like, what do I mean by boundaries? I set boundaries in that even if I start from a defensive cycle, let's say I don't get into my Delahibo lapel guard straight away. I'm never going to let someone go into like super, super late stage, um, half guard smash pass. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, but like, I'm also confident because I trained those situations so much in the past. It's the same sort of, uh, line of thinking that. I believe like Danaher's guys do really well because they train escape so much. They escape the worst positions possible. When you have that mentality of I can escape from any position, you feel almost untouchable. It's a psychological thing. Like if you know you can escape from any position and then get back to the offense, you also reduce the cognitive load in competition. But you don't have to worry, oh my God, this guy might pass me and I also have to worry about attacking. You, I, I believe that we have to reduce our cognitive load so we only focus at one thing at a time. That like I can really engage fully on just trying to attack my partner or trying to funnel it back into my best guard position rather than thinking, oh, I have to funnel back into my guard position and now I got to worry that, oh, maybe they'll pass me in the process of doing that. You can't have that sort of worry. I think people at the highest level don't have that sort of worry unless they, I feel like we often see in competition, like a lot of 50-50 battles where it's like, 
almost like a stalemate. Uh, I think that's fear of engaging in deeper jujitsu, that they are simply okay with just winning by advantage. Like, I, you should scold me if I ever do that actively in a competition because, like, that's not the way I want to win. Like, I definitely want to try and win on my own terms. And that's why I'm just trying to kind of figure out what style of fighter I am and gain deeper understanding of how I can apply my jujitsu to actually win. Well, if, if you're going into a no-gi training phase in the near future, uh, I don't think you'll find much stalling in the 50-50 position. It's it's weird yeah. how one position is a – it's a, in the gi, it's not a stalling position. People have developed attacks and counters and all that, but it can be used as a stalling position. Good luck using that in a no-gi. 100%. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree And the reverse heel hook again. Yeah, I mean, like, especially since Lachlan's run at ADCC, I, I feel like a, a lot of people have been developing, like, the 50-50 position in the Nogi to, like, such a high level. It's so, so dangerous. But it, it's really lovely to see, you know? Like, we don't want to see passive fights, if possible. Like, I know there's been, like, fights that I've personally had that seem pretty passive from the double guard pool, but it's also, like, at, at a certain point, like, it's it's... Personally, from my side at least, it's a desire of wanting to, to display my gods um, at the world stage. I, I think my goal for like the next um, two years is really to start showing my passing game. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's a fairly common development for uh, women in jiu-jitsu because initially when they're starting to train in a mixed environment, they're usually on the bottom and they usually learn that the best way to not get smashed is to develop a really good guard. And even if a, an average sized woman wanted to develop a strong top game, it would be a lot harder if it's she's training difficult. against people who are yeah. 50 pounds heavier. Then when they've been in competition for a while, all of a sudden they discover the love of passing because they're mostly <sighs> competing against people roughly their same weight. Exactly. Like, I, I think, like honestly, I'll tell you a short story like of me being in Madrid. It's like I, I'm fairly happy with my passing game but when i have to fight a man that's a middle heavy heavyweight it's like there's no point in me standing up for the most part i know i'm going to be flung across the room it doesn't even matter how much i've achieved at competition level yeah like and i don't think a lot of people often understand like how how different biologically <laughs> men and females are like i i I've always dumbfounded, like, visiting new places for the first time. So this is, like, before the stage of me establishing my training partners. Like, I had a very fun experience the last couple of days, just, like, really kind of getting tossed around. And, you know, like, especially as, as a female, as a black belt, entering a new environment, often people know who I am because I, I, I just competed at the Europeans. A lot of people nowadays, they also have my instructional. So they're like, oh, my God, it's so-and-so. Let, let's go, like, super fucking hard. I'm like... Oh my god. So yeah, I totally relate. So actually Marillo bans me from uh playing God for 30 days after the Europeans because like basically like I, I scored points in my uh match with Tata and then I basically sat back down. So he was like, You're banned, you can't do shit like that at the highest level. <laughs> so my argument to Marillo was that dude, this guy is way too big. Like how am I even going to pass? Like, I'm just going to be flung back into the guard position. So it was the active choice that I had to play guard. But yeah, to your point, it, it's a lot easier to want to engage in those behaviors when you have people that equally match you or at least um, closer in size. It, it's simply like I'm doing an open way otherwise. <laughs> so question, this is, we're kind of going full circle here. Yeah. When you are training at your various hubs, yeah. with your various training partners. I'm assuming this is mostly one-on-one. -on -one. You're not going into the general population uh, to do a class per se. You're 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 meeting up with three or four people and saying, "Hey, let's let's train." A little bit often, away from Often it is in the off hours of class schedule. However, like I I do try to supplement my training um, by going to classes. Uh, generally, if the instructor is okay with it, I would generally like, prefer to go in the portion that is the rolling section, just because, like, going back to the topic of optimization, like, as much as, like, I, I would love to stay for the technique and stuff, but these days I'm also busy teaching and doing other stuff. I mainly try and prioritize my training in the off hours, like, outside of class time with a few people. Generally, it's, like, two to three people. 
I, I don't really like odd numbers because it always means that someone's sitting out. So generally, like try to strive for having even numbers in a group, like uh, at least like four people or like two people. That's generally enough. Um, and then generally that session is going to be anything between like 90 minutes to two hours. We work like through like a drilling section. Sometimes it's some specific training and then most of the time it's like mainly sparring. Like I, I do like specific training, but honestly, like, I really thrive in just free sparring, gathering data through like just filming, reviewing the footage. And I guess in a way I would turn certain sparring roles into specific training, but over like a longer period of time. Otherwise, I think it's often really easy to anticipate what your partner's going to do. It really does seem that different people at a high level have different optimal training uh, regimen. I mean, there are judoka who do tens of thousands of repetitions of uchikomi, you know, the, the initial off-balancing for the throw. And then there are judoka who just basically spar, and both of them have won Olympic gold medals. Yeah. So who's to say there's no one way that's right for everybody over the 5, 10, 15 years that they've been training. They've learned what works best for them at that time. And I'm sure that eventually they'll go, oh, you know what? In order to get better at this one thing, I need to add more. I don't know. I need to go back to Uchikomi for for a month or two. It, it's, I think, it's very individual. I think you're, you're totally right. It's totally individual. And it's also... I think it's based on what you enjoy the most and like how to keep yourself as happy as possible. And I think this is really underrated, especially in fight sports where everyone's just trying to like kind of one up each other, like who's more badass, like who's more tough. Like it, I don't think it's necessarily always about that. Like I think mental resilience and like just like physical resilience is really important. But I, I think like just because like someone has done something with a particular type of method, if it doesn't resonate with you, there's there's like a fine line between being too self-indulgent and like finding trying to make everything too fun but i also think like you have to let in this kind of spirit of like this is the way that i really like to train but being disciplined enough that you'll actually still train hard and still do the work that you need to do but yeah i don't hear too many people talk about the enjoyment you know because i i think very classically like when we start jujitsu and we start to form our A game, we gravitate towards moves that we like. Generally, I mean, because it feels a certain way or you like the aesthetic of a move. Like for me, a lot of things are very aesthetic based or like based on a feeling. Like if, it, if you like something because of the aesthetic or based on a feeling, like technically you enjoy the move. So I, I honestly don't understand why pe not more people talk about having fun and enjoyment it's generally we hear about like the like, girl oh my god that athlete is so tough oh my god they're so part of they don't really talk too much about this aspect well imagine that the very best way to pass the guard was to force your way into half guard cross face smash and just grind your way past the half guard Let, let's say we have some data to suggest that that's the best yeah. way but you hate doing it and now you force yourself to do something that you hate doing for a long time. You're going to burn out. You're not going to train as often. You're going to find more excuses. You're going to fall out of love with what you're doing faster. So it might actually be better for your overall development to do something that's maybe a 1% less efficient if you enjoy it 100% more. Totally it's like physical conditioning. That. If you, let's say that uh, Tabata sprints are the perfect conditioning for jiu-jitsu. I'm not saying they are. They're, they're pretty good, but let's say they are. But you hate doing them, and you l really like, I don't know, 20-minute runs. I'm going to argue that for most people, to the 20-minute run is the better option because you're going to do it, or the 20-minute swim. Now, if you're getting ready for your UFC debut and you got to do Tabata sprints for a while, okay, okay, you can suffer for a while, but overall probably better to do the things that you enjoy i mean a hundred percent because this is again going back to the topic of consistency and longevity like are you going to be a blue belt that kind of burns out and like falls off the wagon or are you actually going to continue to train jujitsu for like life and you know not to like kind of like go on to a tangent here but like a lot of people who do get injured in jujitsu it's tend to, I believe it's mainly because of the glamorization of 
just being tough or like working past injury. It's not smart. It doesn't advocate for longevity. Like I, I want to say, like I, I've gotten injured. Like I, I can count it on my hands. Like I, no more than that, or maybe one hand even. Like, I haven't had any like huge injuries because I, I I try to advocate again doing things that I enjoy that also is sustainable and I. I like to push myself outside of my comfort zone, but I also understand that the best way to stay consistent is not by kind of like going completely over the top for like two days of the week and then burning out the rest of the week. There's a certain point at which I need to find like what is hard, but hard enough. Whereas like I would say, especially my blue belt career, that was probably the era where I had my most injuries. and. I had an injury at Blue Belt. Actually, I still have a plate in my foot. So I, I fractured, um, I actually displaced my first metatarsal and my right foot from my second metatarsal. So oh. it kind of separated like this. And this also injury. My <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, that's why I have. A, a, um, a, fellow, a fellow survivor. Oh, nice. <laughs> wow, that's where you're going. But yeah, so that was probably the most major injury that I've had in jiu-jitsu. And beyond that, since then, I realized like, wow, there's so many methods to get really good. And you don't have to do it the same way as everybody else. Like, it's just about how can I consistently uh, look at my knowledge acquisition and keep getting better and just obtaining more knowledge and training that knowledge with the best people or the best people in my area. And again, that, that was eventually like what did lead to to me trying to go to world class facilities like AOJ and Unity because like at, at the end of the day, like in, in a lot of world class facilities, more people are geared towards competition. Like the number of people even out who consider themselves to be hobbyists, there's so many hobbyists in Unity who are like just as good as people who consider themselves to be full time. It's like, well at that point, why why make the differentiation <laughs> with the labels? You know, it's just like you're just a jujitsu practitioner. And uh, I, I think, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. So I think with your uh, sociopathic ability to guide opponents into doing uh, what they uh, what what you want them to do, uh, you have now preempted the very last thing I wanted to ask you about, which is injury prevention. I mean, especially when you were early in your career, you probably didn't have the luxury of picking and choosing who you were going to train with. You were in the general population like everybody else. So you were going against a lot of bigger guys. And as you started getting better and more of a name, the incentive to smash the, I don't know, the, the up and coming purple belt was pretty high. So what specific, I mean, you've talked a little bit about avoiding injury in the context of doing things that you enjoy, but yeah. can we get more specific and more granular than that? What, what have you done that has helped limit the amount of injuries? For example, I thought your fingers would be mangled with the emphasis on the lapel. <laughs> Guard, not but, really okay. i mean like oh god in this in this light it looks a little bit worse but like i generally like if i take like a few days off from gi like i went back into gi for europeans um with no gi like my hands went back to normal so this is definitely reversible um so there's a few things i think a lot of people like to talk about stretching and mobility and they're like yeah I, I, I do it. And then it's like, they, they don't really do it. I, I think at the highest level, you really need to be able to feel into your body. So what do, what do I mean by that? Given that your training, uh, at least of a frequency of anything for free to five times a week, especially if it's hard, there are going to be repercussions with your body with the amount of tension it holds. And you need to be really aware of like what's happening with your body. Like even in terms of like if you're walking in bad shoes all the time, all of these things slowly, slowly accumulate. And I think they're really easy to ignore because especially at the lower belts where I had uh, less money to pay for physios and to like get recovery work, body work done. So I, any money I had, I wanted to invest back into training at AOJ or to buy an instructional, stuff like that. I didn't think that recovery was like the number one priority. And also I was younger. I had age on my side, you know, so I, I didn't feel like it was as important to invest my money there. Now, going back to the topic, obviously, of longevity and sustainability, like 
that is of the utmost importance that you have to invest in your recovery. And it doesn't always mean like going to see a physio, going to see a body worker, or that is one part of the equation. Like these days, I at least see a physio or chiropractor at least once a week. It's just like maintaining a car, you know, it's not something that you can neglect, especially at the highest level. If you're training hard a lot, your body isn't just going to feel good. You're not going to recover as much. And this eats into your sleep. When your sleep is all fucked up, then you're just not going to recover. You're going to perform poor and it becomes this vicious, vicious cycle. So the main thing outside of the external things is warming up appropriately. And I don't think warming up has to be in this traditional sense of like, you have to run around the classroom and hip escape. It it can be what you do, what your body needs. And this is why I say that it's really important to understand how to feel into your body because like how I warm up definitely doesn't have to be the way that you warm up because we have different trauma and different history in our bodies. So if, for example, like, I feel like my left knee is holding tightness behind the kneecap and my right foot is holding a little bit more tension. I have to really address those things very specifically to minimize the risk of injury. Because generally, when we think of pain, it's a signal to be more careful. It's not a signal to, oh, I should halt all movement. Because I, I think movement is actually very healing in a way if you do it in the correct fashion but really addressing particular types of warm-up. But I think like lately from what I've seen in the community, uh, the jiu-jitsu community, the movement community in general, people getting really into like uh, controlled articular rotations, um, looking more into mobility work. I think those are really great starts, but it can even be more simple than that. I don't believe you have to look into specific types of modalities to help your body warm up. It's like spend 15, 20 minutes moving your body in a dynamic fashion. Don't move it in a static way. Like I think static stretching, there definitely is some benefit to it for specific people, but that's not really an effective warm up, just in my opinion. Like often, like I'm very unorthodox, I'll admit that. The way I warm up is mainly a blend of like contemporary dance movements and floor work sort of techniques. It almost looks like um, I'm doing a million barren bolos on the floor by myself. <laughs> but that is how I feel I can enjoyably warm up, get my body happy in a way. Because I, what I effectively think a warm up is, is how do I effectively, number one, target any pain areas that I might have. So specifically, if my knee and my foot hurt, I want to address that a little bit more than any other body part. But second of all, it's about how do I prime every part of my body so it's not susceptible to injury. If I fail to warm up my shoulder properly and then I injure my shoulder later, well, there's generally some sort of connection. Because so even if you do get put in some sort of submission hold, um, I generally believe if you are warmed up properly, you really minimize the risk of damage. So yeah, number one is warm up. And then number two is, it's all the external things. But the external things, like they're definitely not as important as having that foundation of warming up appropriately. Second thing I would say is stretching after class. So like definitely a great way to like, again, looking like feeling into your body for the tension that you've created throughout the session. Because generally you are fighting hard against your training partners. Like how do we now dissipate that tension so we're not holding that tension the rest of the day? Because that, that's that's what I think is the main problem, like accumulating tension and not getting rid of it. Then again, it's like we're increasing our susceptibility to getting injured. Yeah, those, those two main things for me. Yeah. I like the emphasis place that you place on recovery. And I think ultimately by the time you're, you can't get your, black belt in jiu-jitsu and be a white belt in recovery uh, you, you need no. to it, you might not become a, a physio a full-on physiotherapist but you do need some understanding of how to put yourself back together after you yourself and your training partners have done your best to take yourself apart well sure because it's also how i look at jiu-jitsu it's more like a martial arts thing right I, I trained in Chinese martial arts growing up, so like I, I think like I tend to have like a very ph- philosophical sense 
<laughs> philosophical sense of internal uh, awareness of my body first. Our body is a vehicle for our practice. So why would you not want to invest in knowing more about your body, how it works, what makes it run? It's like if you bought a Tesla or a Maserati, would you not try to maintain your car well? Would you try to keep it clean? They're like basic fundamentals, things that you should know about your body. Like if you go to the gym to build strength, like you want to build strength, like that's kind of good. But like a lot of people just build aesthetics without thinking about, okay, like how do I improve ways to lift things most efficiently, which I guess goes back into the strength argument. But then again, it's like, I, I think those things, it, we, we should gear our practice more about how do I feel good forever? If you can always build your physical practice around this idea, then you can continue to thrive for years and years. And in jujitsu, it's more based around like, how can I perform better? And how, how can we like accelerate that? And kind of disregard everything else like oh i just want to like train for like a really really bad knee it's like there are ways that you can still train with a knee injury but then it goes back to the conversation of gameplay you have to alter the way that you play the game because if you're just simply going balls to the wall every time with a knee injury the likelihood of making it worse is like just extremely high you know uh, the ultimate example there is the uh, gracie baja guy gordo who basically developed, I wouldn't call it the modern half guard, but the first offensive half guard in jiu-jitsu came from, I believe it was a torn ACL, if not a torn ACL, certainly a bad knee injury that he could no I, longer I remember play. it was some sort of knee injury. Yeah. And as a result, he was the first guy to like start pulling half guard in competition. <laughs> and it was, it was an unthinkable strategy. Well, I, I've enjoyed this tremendously. Um, if other people wish the company of your online presence, where do they find you? Where do they find your instructionals? Uh, how do so they the, you? Best, the best way to talk to me, because generally I do respond to most of my messages, would be on Instagram at the Nomadic Mars. Um, alternatively, like I do currently have some instructionals available on Jiu-Jitsu X, on the De La position, generally on off-balancing concepts, and also on my way of playing the lapel guard. And shortly, I'll actually be filming with BJJ Fanatics as well in a couple of weeks. So should try to check that out once it's all out. I talk about more things like um, building certain mental models around gameplay, space management, things like that. I, I truly am trying to articulate on things that I feel haven't been really touched upon in the general classroom environment. I hope that we'll give especially like gearing is more towards like the beginners or like white and blue belts to have like a understanding of like objectives and motives that we're trying to achieve in jiu-jitsu i feel like this unlocks so much more into enjoying the game as well it's not just about kind of matching techniques so yeah that that should be coming out quite soon too okay. and you've got a program on machiavellian sociopathic mind control coming out <laughs> as well right exactly that we will be do that that will be available that. yes exactly <laughs> Oh, that's only it, your... that's, that's what we're going to do. The art of deception. <laughs> the art of deception. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Good luck with thank your you train. You're off to New York tomorrow. I am indeed, but I'm going to I'm going to Austin via New York. Yes. Awesome. Well, happy travels and uh, good luck with your competition. Thank you so much, Theo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.